Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website and remind our internet viewers that they can send questions or comments throughout the program simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. For those in-house, we would appreciate your making sure cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. And we, of course, will post the program within the next day on our Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. Hosting our program today is Dr. Ariel Cohen, Senior Research Fellow in our Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for International Studies. His firsthand knowledge of the former Soviet Union and the Middle East are the focus of his work. He looks into the economic development, political reform in the former Soviet republics, U.S. energy security, the global war on terrorism, and continuing conflict in the Middle East. He has served as a consultant to both the executive branch, the private sector on policy toward Russia, Eastern and Central Europe, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. He co-authored Russia, Imperialism, Development in Crisis, and also co-authored and edited the book Eurasia in Balance, which focuses on the power shift in that region that occurred after the 9-11 attacks. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ariel Cohen. Ariel. Thank you very much, John. Um, you're running a terrific program here at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, welcome to all our viewers and listeners on the internet. You are welcome to pose questions to the speakers. Um, and uh, welcome to all of you, of course. Uh, these are truly uh, historic times in Europe and in the world. Uh, I personally do believe this is the most uh, serious crisis since the end of the Cold War. Probably the historians will look at it and uh, identify it as the end of the post-Cold War peace uh, that uh, existed since 89. Um, and uh, there are uh, very important issues that the uh, keynote speaker and the distinguished panel is going to discuss, including what is the value of U.S. Uh, and other great powers guarantees to sovereignty uh, of countries that rely upon such um, guarantees for their security? Uh, what is the course uh, that the Russian state has embarked upon in 2008 with the war in Georgia and de facto annexation of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and now in the Crimea and possibly beyond. What is the value of the collective security in Europe? Uh, so these are very important questions. We have uh, a keynote from the region um, and um, a truly uh, massive brain power uh, uh, with this panel from different perspectives. So let's start with the keynote. Uh, ambassador Marina Kaljurand uh, is ambassador of Estonia since September 2011. Prior to that, she was undersecretary uh, of foreign economic relations and development in Estonia, uh, non-resident ambassador to Kazakhstan, ambassador to the Russian Federation in 2005 and 2008. And what uh, she modestly hides in her bio, she was a target of nastiest attacks uh, in Moscow by NASHI, uh, the pro-government uh, youth organization, uh, and in the media. Uh, ambassador, I'm glad to say, uh, went to our common alma mater, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and was a Fulbright scholar, um, and uh, also, like myself, has an LLB, but not like me, uh, cum laude, from Tartu <laughs> University um, and uh, taught uh, in uh, Estonian School of Diplomacy. The um, panel uh, is great uh, because we have uh, the repeat performance of Ambassador Kurt Volker. You may remember Kurt as a keynote at our uh, Ukrainian accession uh, or failed accession to the EU conference in November. Uh, I will disclose to you that after that conference, the speakers took a vote, and uh, the result of the vote, the speakers and some diplomats, 
uh, the, it was eight against three. Eight said that Ukraine will ascend. This was a week before ascension. Eight said that Ukraine will ascend. Three of us, including myself, said Ukraine will not ascend. And unfortunately, we turned out to be true. Ambassador Volker today is executive director of McCain Institute, Institute for International Leadership, part of Arizona State University. He served as U.S. ambassador to NATO. Uh, and since leaving the government, he is involved in business consulting and uh, in, think tank, in the think tank world. He is senior advisor to the Atlantic Council, senior fellow with uh, the Center for Transatlantic Relations at Johns Hopkins, um, and served as managing director for BGR, one of the leading consultancies here in um, the city, and a senior advisor at McLarty. Um, Ambassador Volker regular appears on BBC, Al Jazeera, CNN, Fox, etc., and has a BA from Temple and MA in International Relations from uh, the Elliott School and George Washington. To his left, not necessarily politically, is my old friend Yevgeny Kisilov. Uh, Yevgeny is a leading analyst and political com commentator in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, he was until recently director of news at Inter TV uh, and uh, was uh, a star anchor and news director in Russia. Uh, I remember uh, Yevgeny uh, as the head of NTV uh, in the days uh, when NTV was a free channel and criticized Russian politics, including President Boris Yeltsin that was really cutting edge <coughs> TV in uh, the 1990s, the period that now is greatly maligned in Russia. Uh, he was general director for Moscow Independent Broadcasting Corporation. Um, he was general manager of TV6 uh, and was the anchor of Power with Evgeny Kisilov and RTVI, Big Politics with Evgeny Kisilov, and Details of the Week. Uh, he currently writes for the Moscow Times, Forbes, Gazeta.ru, GQ, wow, and uh, others. His degrees are from Moscow State in History and Eastern Studies, and he speaks Farsi. Mm. To his left uh, is uh, my good friend Stephen Blank. Uh, Dr. Blank, uh, for 24 years, was the head of the Russian program and a research professor at the U.S. Army War College at Carlisle Barracks. Um, he is an authority of Russia's nationalities policy since his Ph.D. Uh, and the book Sorcerer's Apprentice. Uh, uh, no. Sorcerer as Apprentice. Sorcerer as Apprentice about Stalin's role as the People's Commissar for Nationalities. He taught at University of California, Riverdale, University of Texas, U.S. Air War College, and has a PhD and ma master's and PhD from University of Chicago. Last but not least, my colleague Luke Coffey, uh, who is covering our Europe and NATO portfolio at the Margaret Thatcher as a Margaret Thatcher Fellow at the Margaret Thatcher Center uh, at the Heritage Foundation. Before joining Heritage, Luke uh, was uh, an advisor, um, senior special advisor to then British Defense Secretary Liam Fox, I think the only American in UK defense establishment, a senior position. And um, uh, Luke uh, worked in the House of Commons and published in the Daily Telegraph, Guardian, Express, Sun. His portfolio is huge, not only Europe, but uh, the Arctic and other things. His master's is uh, from the London School of Economics and bachelor's from the University of Missouri. With that, Madam Ambassador, we're all ears, as Ross Perot used to say, and after that, we'll go to the panel. Dear friends, it's always an honor and pleasure to speak at the Heritage. Me, myself, and my embassy have had traditionally very good relations with the Heritage, and we're, we're really I'm really happy to be here. And I'm really happy to participate in a discussion with so, such a prominent panel. And from uh, as Ariel was saying, yes, I graduated from Tartu University. You couldn't attend Tartu University at that time because good. it was behind. You could? Okay. No. We were on the same side. I'm yeah? glad. But all, to all the others, Tartu University is now open. Please come. It's one of the best universities in Europe, four years older than Harvard. So please take the chance and come to see Tartu University. 
And I'm very pleased to see Evgeny, whom I met three, the last time, seven, eight years ago, when I was posted to Russia, and with whom we had very interesting conversations then, and I hope to continue it today. I'll start with my remarks. I don't have a written speech, because everything's changing so quickly. Uh, I'll start with the present situation, then I'll say some words about the Baltics and Baltic security. After that, EU, EU's response, NATO, NATO's response, and a couple of words about international community, how international community has reacted, and what should we expect further. I think that perhaps there is no need to reaffirm here our very clear position that whatever word we use, aggression, occupation, annexation, what's happening today in, U in Ukraine is violation of international law, violation of all international law, uh, principles and norms of international law. And those who violate international law should be, should be responsible for that. Again, perhaps no need to repeat here that what's happening today in Crimea, it's illegal puppet government. The referendum that's going to take place this weekend is illegal. It's contradictory to the constitution of Ukraine and so on. The pretext of protection of Russian nationals in Ukraine is ridiculous. So far, there are no evidences of violation of the rights of any national minorities or any minorities living in Crimea in Ukraine. If I look back at the history, it reminds very much what happened before the Second World War in our countries, countries in the Baltics. In 1939, my country, under pressure, concluded a military base agreement with then Soviet Union. In June 1940, Soviet troops entered physically my country. The troops overnumbered the then Estonian troops. In July, we had puppet regime installed. In August, Estonian Soviet Socialist Republic applied for membership in the Soviet Union, which was immediately granted, which means that starting from the base agreement in nine months, we were part of Soviet Union. Unfortunately, what we see today in Crimea uh, recalls exactly what happened in the Baltic states. The country is different than it was Soviet Union, but the country we see acting today is a successor of Soviet Union. And as I can say, uh, the leaders of the today's Russia are looking favorably at the Soviet Union and are learning from the, from the practices and the deeds of Soviet Union. What should be today, what is today our message to Ukraine? We fully support Ukrainian government. Being a lawyer, and we have analyzed it thoroughly, the legal acts that took place in Kiev were according to Ukrainian constitution, so there are no doubts about the present Ukrainian government being legal and constitutional. We should praise and we should say honestly that what the Ukrainian government is doing today is right. They haven't followed provocations. They, are, they have started already with reforms. They are working very closely with EU, with IMF, with everybody who can reach the region. Of course, I'm looking very forward to the visit of Prime Minister Yatsenyuk today to Washington, D.C., and, and, and hope to hear about his discussions with, with uh, his U.S. partners, and, and hopefully there's going to be a press conference where we learn more about that. What we should do today, I know that it's very difficult to reach Crimea. I know that our ambassador to Ukraine has tried to do it a couple of times, even almost landed and then was turned away. But I know that some people could reach Crimea, and we should send as many independent observers, being them EU observers, OSCE observers, to the ground to document, <coughs> to find the facts, what's happening on the ground. Not only Crimea, but also to eastern Ukraine. Most likely, what's happening today in Crimea might 
uh, follow in a couple of days or pretty soon in in eastern part of Ukraine, just to find the real facts and to describe the real situation on the ground. We have to keep we have to keep pressure on Russia to do something to de-escalate the situation and to start talking to Ukrainian government. Only via talking you can find solution to the problem. Nobody wants further escalation of the situation in Ukraine because I think that today nobody can say how far can it go and what might be the real consequences of any other than diplomatic solution. Baltic states. Lots of questions have been raised about the security of the Baltic states. I think that the main and principal difference between us, the Baltic states, Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova, is that we are part of EU, we are part of NATO. So when I'm sometimes asked, but you're ge geographically so close to Russia, yes, that's true, we are close to Russia. But mentally, and in our governments, we are very far from Russia. So uh, we are glad that our partners in NATO and we, being partners, allies in NATO, have reassured the Eastern members of NATO. We know that strategically Russia might think that the Baltics are the soft underbelly of NATO. We've seen not very friendly exercises on our border as well as in the northeastern part uh, of Russia recently. And putting all these facts together, it's very important that their security and NATO membership and collective defense are reassured in the region close to Russia. EU. I can, I, can, I can assure you that EU is following the situation very closely. There are non-stop consultations going on between the EU leaders. And I'm sure that you've seen the document by the heads of government of state of the 6th of March. EU is 28 states. Sometimes it's not, maybe sometimes it's too bureaucratic and sometimes it's not very easy to find a common wording or common solution, but what EU has done so far is not bad, it's good. Uh, heads of governments and states discussed the steps that could be punitive steps toward Russia in the, uh, during the, uh, for in the Ukrainian crisis, and some of them have been uh, taken. For example, the suspension of visa facilitation. It might sound that what does it matter? From the case of Estonia, I can say that after we had cyber attacks in 2007, one of the leverages was, we had was visa refusal to those who were responsible for those attacks. And it worked. Because the people, the, the Russian people, they do want to come to Europe. They do want to have their children studying in Europe. They do like vacations in Europe. And they have assets in Europe. So visa, visa refusal of visas is a very well working tool, we can say from our experience. As to the other possible steps, be it visa ban and assets freeze, I'm looking forward to the discussion that's going to take place in, in EU on the 17th of March. So we hear what will be the results there. But I can say that it's a common position of the EU that what's happening today is a violation of international law. It changes the situation in Europe and we have to reconsider. What does it mean? What should be our further steps? Of course, we are dependent on Russia. We as EU, we are dependent on Russia, but it's not a one-way street. If we talk about trade and energy, then it's two-way street. One part is selling, another part is buying. So sanctions might be difficult for the EU and we have to discuss it very openly. Why not to think about compensation fund or something? We have to have studies of implications of introduction of sanctions and the contra sanctions or contra punitive measures that might be taken by Russia. Yes, it's a problem, we have to discuss it. 
but it doesn't mean that at some point we shouldn't be ready to introduce sanctions. I want to repeat, not today, but at some point when we see that the steps undertaken so far are not working. And it reminds once more to, to Europe that we need more thorough discussion on energy security. Some countries in Europe depend 90, up to 93% on Russian energy sources. So we have to discuss that and we have to be very serious there. Another thing, uh, what the EU is undertaking at the moment, we are looking at all the trade uh, possibilities for Ukraine. There are financial packages to Ukraine and the association agreement is on the table. If Ukrainian government, U Ukraine wants to sign it, they can do it after they, they have had their presidential elections and they have their president in power somewhere, uh, somewhere in May. But the agreement is there. At the moment, we're working with the trade part of that agreement to go more quickly, but the, ag the agreement is there, it's open, and every nation has the right to decide what organization the nation wants to join after they fulfill the necessary criteria. NATO. Perhaps Kurt is going to say more about that because he's a real professional, but I, I just I'll try to make a very, very uh, mild and brief introduction. Uh, NATO also has taken already concrete steps. We have suspended planning for the first NATO rule joint, joint uh, NATO Russian joint exercise. There are no staff level civilian or military meetings between NATO and Russia, but that's not enough. When we talk about the NATO summit that's going to be in uh, September this year, then six months ago, it wasn't popular to talk about enlargement. Estonia being among the last enlargement to NATO 10 years ago, we are very pro open door policy. We see what it did to our country, what it did to our region. From consumers of international security, today we are providers of international security. It's not only military, it's mental. It, these are changes, these are real changes that turn countries into democracies. That's why we are very pro European inter integration, open door policy in the EU and pro open door policy in NATO. Again, it's up to each and every nation to decide. So today, I think we have more moral obligation to talk about enlargement. If half a year ago we were not talking about Georgia and map to Georgia, it wasn't popular, then today I think the time is right to talk about that. <coughs> and of course, at some point, NATO has to look thoroughly at the NATO-Russia relations and what are the implications and how to go further. And finally, some remarks about international community. So far, we've seen that uh, United States, EU have been very strong in their statements. Uh, United States, very strong in their statements. We have common understanding on what's happening uh, in Ukraine, and there are no question marks about that. What President Obama is doing with his outreach to other leaders is very important. Because even if the, uh, when, what might be the solution, the only solution today we see, if it's through negotiations, it's important to start negotiations, and the negotiations shouldn't go w without the participation of Ukrainians. Ukrainians should be at the table, and the contact group or mediation group, whatever we call it, it should be about the fate of Ukrainians. Outreach to other countries, very important. We see that international community has been maybe pretty slow. The statements are maybe not as strong as we would like them to be. Of course, each and every country is looking at their national interests. We see some countries who are paying attention to uh, territorial uh, integrity and sovereignty. Other countries are uh, stating clearly that what's happening is a violation of international norms. So we have to talk also to other countries so that Russia sees it's not only Europe and US who think like that, but it's much wider. It's international community that thinks like that. 
we have G7 statement, we have Security Council working, we have OSCE working, so we have to make also, we have to encourage also other countries besides Europeans, US, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, to be more outspoken and to take their position on the crisis. Because it might sound like a slogan, but after what's happening today in Ukraine, the world is not the same anymore. The events in Ukraine are something you don't expect in the 21st century. Something that perhaps nobody expected, even after the war in Georgia, that they m something like that ma may happen. Countries might be asking, who's the next? And in that sense, the very strict, very prompt response to the actions is extremely, extremely important. And here I start my introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Charlie. Do, do you want ex cathedra or? I, I'm happy here unless you'd like me to. Go ahead. Standing. I have to stand. No. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, and Marina. Thank you. That was a great, uh, great introduction and a good <coughs> overview of everything. I'll um, just walk through a few basic points, if I could. And let me also apologize in advance that I have a commitment at 1 p.m., so I will need to duck out in time to meet that. Um, First off, uh, Marina made this point. I want to second it. Uh, Ariel made this point. Uh, what we are seeing is big. It's important. Uh, it is extremely significant for a country to insert its forces into another country, to occupy that territory, to orchestrate a referendum, and to annex that territory. And we're in the process of witnessing this. Uh, it is something that we think maybe, oh, this doesn't happen anymore. Or, this is something that happened a generation ago. This is what people did in the 1930s. This isn't today. It's today. Uh, so we need to be aware of just the magnitude of what we're talking about. The second thing, um, this is on a fast timeline. There's a lot of efforts to call meetings and create processes and to look into things and research. Well, this is going to happen this weekend. <laughs> so on, um, uh, I believe it's Saturday. It might be Sunday, but I 16th. believe it's Saturday the 16th. Sunday the 16th. Sunday the 16th. The Crimeans will vote in a referendum. The choice is to join Russia now or join Russia later. And uh, I'm pretty confident the, uh, the Russians will ensure that the answer is now. And I'm sure they will immediately say, well, they are welcome to do so. It's already been said uh, that they would be welcome to do so, and that'll proceed apace. European foreign ministers are meeting on Monday. This may all be, be done by then. Next point I want to make is the difference between words and deeds. Um, it's easy for people to make statements and say, we don't like this, this is bad, this has to change, we don't accept it. But when you have a player who is willing to create the facts on the ground, that actually matters. So inserting military forces, controlling the territory, barricading bases, uh, uh, accreting the powers of governance in that region, putting up barbed wire. We can say all we want, but Putin has taken Crimea. <laughs> and that's a fact. And I think we have to draw a distinction. If we want our words of not unacceptability, of not recognizing this, of not being legitimate, if we want those words to mean something, we also have to be prepared to take actions. Um, another point I want to make, um, Marina quite rightly again mentioned this in her remarks, uh, don't assume that Crimea is the last thing to talk about. Uh, I think with a successful grab of Crimea after this weekend, we will see increasing calls for similar referenda in a couple of other parts of Ukraine. People in Donetsk might say, oh, well, we deserve to have a referendum and decide where we want to be. And I'm sure we'll get a lot of encouragement in that from Russia, of all types of encouragement. And I think we should be aware now that this is a likely scenario and therefore be prepared to take steps aimed directly at preventing that. Uh, again, not just words, but steps, uh, actions. So when we talk about sanctions, when we talk about travel bans, when we talk about um, use of some NATO assets, such as cu is currently being done with surveillance, 
uh, we should also be linking it to preventing this action. And one, you know, the furthest one might go is to say that NATO has a direct interest in the territorial integrity of Ukraine uh, beyond the loss of Crimea, so that any further loss of territory would not uh, would would meet a reaction of some kind. That would be a step. And uh, I think it's something that deserves some serious consideration to stop this, because otherwise, we'll just I, I think Putin will just see how far he can go. Uh, another point, um, again, I'm echoing Marina, uh, no surprise here. Uh, Article 5 matters. It is a treaty obligation of the United States and all European allies to defend the territory of all NATO members against threats to their territory. And since we have a practice now we've seen in Georgia and we are seeing it in Ukraine where Russia hands Russian-speaking people passports and then says it has a right to act to defend Russian citizens, this is something that is rightly of concern to the Baltic states and potentially others, and is something where we need to be very clear up front, in advance, complete with action, not just words, <clears throat> that we take the territorial integrity and sovereignty and independence and freedom of all of our allies uh, with deadly seriousness. The um, Next point I would make uh, is I, on this point of NATO enlargement. I think part of what we've seen is that the advancement of the idea of a Europe where people are free, they can create a democracy, they can choose their own security orientation, they don't have to worry about their security in the future, this idea of a Europe whole, free, and at peace, uh, has not really advanced in the last several years, and in fact maybe has retreated a little bit it's important that we put it back on the table and say these are aspirations that every people in Europe has a right to aspire to and we support them in those efforts. And that means uh, with the NATO summit coming up in September, NATO enlargement should be a topic of discussion, a serious topic of discussion. We should look at Montenegro. They've applied to join NATO. They've done a lot of reforms. They have more to do. But rather than using that as a, uh, a reason to keep them out, we should be using that as uh, their desire to join NATO as leverage to get those remaining reforms done so it can be a success. And I would hope that that's even possible by September. Uh, but whether it's possible by September or not, uh, the goal ought to be clear. I would also suggest that um, we should be very supportive and encouraging of Greece and Macedonia to resolve the name dispute so that uh, Macedonia also can become a part of NATO, possibly even uh, invited at September, if that could be done. I think a lot more action, a lot more effort needs to go into this if that's going to be real. Uh, two final points. Um, governance in Ukraine. I don't think any of us should be satisfied at the moment with the quality of the Ukrainian government's inclusiveness and outreach to all citizens of Ukraine. Um, just because Russia is breaking off a piece of Ukrainian territory is not a good enough reason to view Russian-speaking or ethnic Russian citizens of Ukraine differently than any other citizens of Ukraine. Uh, and it ought to be a, a clear priority of the government to build as much national unity as possible uh, with all Ukrainian citizens. And then the final point, um, because I know there are probably people from the media here, I'll just flag um, an article that went up on time.com this, uh, this morning, which I authored. And if you're looking for quotes to use, that's a ready source that you can just go to, and then you don't have to worry so much about taking good notes. And I will stop there. Thank you. It's my turn now. <coughs> well, um, I'd like to continue from uh, the point that was made uh, by Mr. Walker uh, about um, the um, so-called um, Russian citizens that receive uh, Russian citizenship in former Soviet republics that are now independent states and EU and NATO members. Uh, I think that... Uh, a recent announcement made uh, by Russian 
ambassador in Riga, in Latvia, uh, Mr. Alexander Vishnikov, that Russia is thinking about changing its legislation so that Russian nationals, non-citizens of uh, Latvia may receive full Russian citizenship and Russian passports without being resident in Russia is another indication of very far-reaching <coughs> plans of uh, Moscow, of Putin's regime, uh, to continue psychological and political pressure uh, on neighboring states. Uh, and what we are witnessing now in Kyiv, uh, in Ukraine, um, in Crimea, uh, I would not agree with those who are saying that Mr. Putin uh, is re returning to the methods uh, of the 19th century. As a matter of fact, I would rather agree with those who are saying that we are looking some kind of a new warfare, uh, which is unheard of in the modern world, when there's a whole covert military operation involving thousands of uh, unidentified troops uh, without any signs of belonging to an army who appear from nowhere and probably will disappear into nowhere. You know, uh, they are now calling them men in green. Uh, they're also referred to in Ukrainian um, social networks as the polite, uh, opposite to, well, you know, military sometimes are very rude and, uh, well, um, they tend to use three and four letter words. And these were very, very polite, very tough, very insistent. Then they th were thro throwing uh, the local government out of their buildings, but always very polite, though determined. And so uh, I personally have no doubt that this is a covert operation by elite uh, Russian uh, special detachments, commando troops, I don't know to what uh, particular organization uh, they report, but uh, there's no doubt that this is kind of a new warfare that uh, a war, a new war that uh, Russia is waging. And uh, before this round table started, this panel started, I spoke <coughs> to some of my colleagues in Kyiv, well, and, uh, you know, mm, they are now talking not about the situation in Crimea, they, they, th those of them who are uh, realistically assessing the situation, they understand that, well, in all probability, Crimea is lost. We are now talking about uh, continuing concentration of uh, Russian troops uh, on western, oh, I'm sorry, on eastern borders uh, of um, Ukraine, mm, especially in some regions that are quite close to Kyiv. It's just 200, 250 kilometers uh, from uh, eastern border, uh, for example, in, in Chernigovskaya region, uh, to Kyiv, and um, today the newly appointed Secretary of the National uh, Security and Defense Council, uh, Mr. Andriy Porubi, announced that uh, according to the information gathered by Ukrainian intelligence, uh, in spite of the uh, statements made by Mr. Putin um, during his uh, press conference that took place uh, a week ago, when he announced that the military exercises are over and uh, the troops are uh, going back to the barracks. The troops are not going back to the barracks and um, you can even find uh, information and uh, photographs posted uh, on Facebook made by passers-by who are just driving from Moscow to Kiev along the main uh, automobile route and uh, they witness um, troops and armored personnel carriers uh, going um, in the direction of, in the direction of uh, Ukrainian border. Uh, 
Uh, so again, there might uh, be a new situation uh, when we will be continuing to discuss um, Russian intervention in Crimea, on the Crimean Peninsula, while it will change dramatically and we could be talking about Russian invasion of the um, continental Ukraine uh, somewhere not very far from Kiev. Mm, and uh, mobilization of reservists uh, was announced today. Mm, Where? In, in, in Ukraine. In Ukraine. That's, that's what uh, Mr. Parubi said. Well, it's, uh, these reports are still unconfirmed, but probably uh, Prime Minister Yutsenyuk, who, is, uh, who will be talking today to the public, as far as I know, uh, he will be meeting um, with the public in uh, Atlantic Council at 4 p.m. Maybe he will clarify uh, the situation. Um, and uh, in my opinion, what uh, Russia's rulers are doing now uh, it, it's just a, a very significant attempt to to change the rules, to, uh, as a matter of fact, to eliminate some basic rules by which uh, modern international relations are governed. Uh, and as far as Ukraine is concerned, look um, what uh, Mr. Putin is saying. Uh, his recent statement uh, that was made uh, during his meeting with the leader of uh, Crimean Tatars, who was invited to Moscow. Uh, he said that, in a sense, uh, the declaration of Ukrainian independence back in uh, 1991 was not completely legitimate. Uh, the, I'm, I'm speaking of the uh, declaration of Ukrainian uh, independence, which is a basic uh, act uh, in, the, in, in the foundation of the independent Ukrainian state. It was announced uh, on the 24th of August 1991 after uh, the failure of the attempt coup in Moscow. Uh, and now Mr. Putin uh, says that it was not perfectly legal and legitimate because there was, uh, there was a procedure of leaving uh, the Soviet Union, and Ukraine did not completely uh, abide by the rules that existed in August 1991. Uh, then we all remember uh, Mr. Putin's statement about um, the alleged fact that uh, Ukraine is now a different country, a different state, uh, not the state. Uh, mm, that was back in 1994 when the uh, Budapest uh, Protocol was signed. And so Russia is not carrying any obligations under that protocol because now we've got another Ukrainian state uh, that appeared as a result of the revolution on the Maidan. And finally, uh, there's a different, uh, there's a definite indication of future uh, Kremlin plans for the political destabilization uh, in the country uh, with regard to the forthcoming election. Uh, when Mr. Putin says, look, uh, we shall analyze the situation, we shall assess how legitimate this election uh, was, and then we shall decide what, uh, what are we going to do with the outcome. And uh, sometimes uh, I wish I could add to his words, we shall see who the winner is, and then we'll decide whether we accept it or not. So I think uh, these are the basic further roots of uh, Russian intervention. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Russian attempts of political destabilization of the country. And finally, may I say that um, probably the biggest problem uh, is that um, many states of the world who are witnessing 
recent developments in Ukraine, uh, uh, must be asking this question, who is going to defend us? And how can we defend us if any kind of aggression takes place? And this may be an end to all the international attempts to prevent uh, the spread of nuclear weapons and many other uh, diplomatic campaigns uh, that can now be, so to say, null and void. That's about all I was going to say. Evgeny, you usually are more optimistic than I am, but this time you're beating me in pessimism. That this is really scary. So well, but but, but what happens uh, if uh, there's an airborne uh, uh, a group of airborne troops in Kiev? I understand perfectly well that even if uh, Russian paratroopers uh, land uh, in the center of Kiev, uh, nobody is going to wage a war against Russia. I think in Kiev there will be shooting. No, no. Who will be shooting? People, the people will be shooting at the Russian paratroopers. People will be shooting at Russian paratroopers. Yeah. But I am saying that I have serious doubts about uh, possible intervention uh, on the part of the West, NATO, but European Union, United States because, of America. Because we're dealing with two, with two and possibly more nuclear powers. That that's the absolutely, main reason. absolutely. And but, but the, or the other problem, uh, as far as Mr. Putin is concerned, he is behaving. Uh, like a small child, we all have children, and uh, you know, uh, he he's trying to establish the red line. You know, uh, when he's really going to be punished by by the grown-ups. Well, you know? if it's a small child with intercontinental ballistic nuclear missiles, about 550 of those, some of them with independently targeted. Uh, warheads. It, it's a very dangerous small child. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to Steve Blank now, who knows something about nuclear weapons <laughs> and small children. Go ahead. <laughs> I have two, but they're grown. Um, thank you. Um, building upon the optimistic statements we've just heard, I want to talk. I want to talk about some of the lessons of this crisis because the facts are pretty well known. First of all. The current crisis is not an aberration of Russian policy. It is the logical culmination of years of Russian policy. Many of us warned about it, and none of us will listen to. I, Ariel, Janusz Bogaisky, Taras Kuzio, other people foresaw, publicly stated that this could happen and might well happen, and that Putin had no respect for Ukrainian sovereignty, and everybody looked at us like we were warmongers and so on. Today, the results speak for themselves. Secondly, as my colleagues have said, this is the beginning. It's not the end. And passivity invites further challenges, as Yevgeny has just talked about. Beyond that, there are several lessons here. First of all, the crisis has buried the post-Cold War assumption that war in Europe is inconceivable. Second, the West's passivity and the utter incomprehension of Putin and Russia show that neither Europe nor Washington are ready to defend the post-Cold War settlements of 1989 to 91, or realize that the world has not left realpolitik or the old politics behind. Power politics is well and al alive and well, not only in Moscow, but in Beijing, in Tehran, and in other places. And they will draw the appropriate lessons from this crisis as well. Indeed, the belief in the end of such phenomena is now shown, as it should have always been shown, to be quite fallacious. So the crisis second and third lessons are that European security is, in fact, divisible, and that Europe, as has too often been the case in its history, will not fight for Eastern Europe and is cognitively unprepared for the current world. Fourth, as long as these conditions are imperative, or excuse me, are operative, Russia will continue expanding its self-proclaimed sphere of influence and empire. Fifth, the previous generation belief that Russia wants to be or can be integrated into Europe has been exploded. Russia wants a free hand, it wants empire and great power status, not integration. It equates integration with subordination, and it certainly resists liberal democracy, which it regards as the greatest of all possible threats to Russian security. And because Russian power cannot therefore be integrated into a European normative and political order, 
but instead insists on corrupting, subverting, and undermining this order as the condition of its survival, it must be contained. We must therefore understand that this insight leads to the next lesson. Russia's imperial land and power grabs in Georgia, Ukraine, its efforts to undermine security in Moldova and the Caucasus, and its permanent saber rattling in the Baltics show not only that Russia remains unreconciled to the 1991 loss of empire, but something much deeper. Putin and, and his, quote, boyars, end of quote, firmly believe that their system and any imaginable Russian state cannot exist or be governed except as an empire. Empire for Moscow represents the necessary condition of survival against the threat of westernization. And this reinforces the previous point that Russian imperialism is intrinsic to the system, not an aberration. The quest for empire, however, inevitably and inescapably means war. It means war not only because Russia, as shown in Ukraine and Georgia, cannot accept the genuine sovereignty or territorial integrity of any of its neighbors, including those in Eastern Europe, from Poland to the uh, uh, Black Sea. And you can trace this in many quotes from Russian statesmen, ambassadors, and so on. All of the agreements Russia has signed with them, as Yevgeny has just shown, are regarded in Moscow as scraps of paper, a phrase we heard 100 years ago with devastating consequences then. Therefore, Moscow must subvert, corrupt, undermine, or even try to conquer those territories to preserve the, its ruling elite in power in Moscow and to consolidate domestic support around great Russian state nationalism. This imperial drive also means war because the peoples in Russia's path will resist and because economically the Russian state cannot, despite Putin's illusions, sustain the burdens of empire over time. Only if the transatlantic alliance understands and assimilates these lessons can it successfully roll back the current challenge and restore the basis for a genuinely free and unified Europe, which is the only lasting basis for European security. This means the military revitalization of NATO and its full willingness to uphold its agreements to support <coughs> Ukraine's security, as stated in the 1997 NATO-Ukraine Treaty. This does not necessarily mean war, but it does mean a combination of resolute, continuing military support for Ukraine, tough economic sanctions against Russia's government, banking system, and the ruble, and the decisive reorganization over the long term of European energy policy. It also means exposing Russia's undeclared, quote, asymmetric, end of quote, war on Europe, and its efforts to corrupt its political figures and institutions. For the EU, it means not only devising a package to restore Ukraine to economic health, but also practical assistance and a genuine promise of membership in the EU on the condition that Kiev carry out the arduous but necessary long-term reforms and that it also, along with NATO, guarantees Ukraine security while doing so. This also probably means bringing Turkey into the EU to give Turkey an option beyond Russia and to reverse Turkey's own current anti-democratic trends. The present crisis has exposed Western reluctance to act on Ukraine's behalf. This appeasement, for that's what it is in the face of genuine acts of war, is wholly misplaced and dangerous. Crimea is only the beginning, and until and an or less the West vigorously responds and restores Ukraine's integrity, it will face ever-mounting challenges and not just from Russia. If we choose passivity and appeasement, we will again relive Churchill's post-Munich admonition that, quote, England had a choice between dishonor and war. She chose dishonor. She will have war. Thank you. Okay, the grade of pessimism is skyrocketing. <laughs> I hope um, I that you know. Luke Coffey will break the trend, but I'm not so sure. Yeah, Steve, sometimes. this was an excellent presentation. Whether everybody agrees with you or not is a different matter, but uh, you are more impressive than usual. Luke? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Churchill also said that appeasement is hoping that the uh, crocodile eats you last. Um, just to add to the Churchill theme. Um, I, I want to first start off by thanking uh, Madam Ambassador. F um, I, I never pass up an opportunity to acknowledge and thank and congratulate Estonians for what Estonia does to um, uh, transatlantic security, to NATO it is a beacon, it is, a, it is an example of how um, some of the bigger NATO members should behave. I've personally seen um, on the front lines in Helmand province, one of the most dangerous places in Afghanistan, Estonian soldiers fighting and dying alongside British soldiers and uh, Estonian special forces fighting alongside American special forces. Um, 
they are really a, a model for uh, what NATO could be in the future. Um, in the middle of the 19th century, former British Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary Lord Palmerston said the following about Russia, and I quote, the policy and practice of the Russian government has always been to push forward its encroachments as fast and far as apathy or want of firmness from other governments would allow it to go, but to always stop and retire when it met with decided resistance, and then to wait for the next favorable opportunity. Some things never change. This is the same type of Russia I believe we are seeing today. There's been a lot of talk about, um, we're seeing a, a resurgence of a Cold War Russia, a Soviet Russia. Um, everyone has their opinions on this, but in my opinion, I actually, I think we're not seeing this really. We're seeing uh, Russia more keen to its behavior in the 19th century, an imperial Russia. In the eyes of the Russians in the 17 and 1800s, territorial gains were not regarded as annexations per se, but as a coming into what was already theirs. At the time, Russia's imperial conquests were popularly characterized as acts of liberation of fellow Christian or Orthodox Christians against, um, in many cases, Polish Catholic rule. Take out the religious dimension of this today and insert um, the need to protect, in the words of Vladimir Putin, Moscow's fraternal ties with ethnic Russians. And we have a similar situation. Whether it is South Ossetia, Abkhazia, Crimea, the creation of the proposed Eur Eurasian Union, the customs union with Belarus and Kazakhstan, the CSTO, Moscow sees itself, in the eyes of Moscow, they see themselves as taking what is already theirs. And they fail to understand that there is no place for this behavior in the 21st century. What we have seen in the past couple of weeks in Crimea has been calculated and it has been deliberate. The re recent Russian intervention is almost textbook. Promote and induce political instability in a region, exploit the ethnic cleavages inside a local population, call for the protection of Russian, ethnic Russians, issue passports to ethnic Russians, conduct a major military training exercise in the region, and then intervene. This was Georgia in 2008, as the panel has already highlighted, and six years later, about 10,000 Russian troops still occupy what amounts to 20% of Georgia's territory. It is becoming clear that the West in general, and the Obama administration in particular, faces the current predicament in part thanks to several false assumptions about 21st century geopolitics. That Europe is now stable and secure, and that the United States doesn't need to stay engaged in the same way that it used to. That only the big powers matter in international relations. That Russia is willing to be a credible and responsible partner to the West, and that Putin can be trusted. That the world is safe enough that real military capability is no longer a requirement for global influence. Recent events have proven these assumptions to be wrong. These false assumptions have sadly translated into policy choices on both sides of the Atlantic, which have encouraged, if not outright promoted, Russia's current behavior. The US disengagement from Europe in almost every policy area. The removal of more than 10,000 US soldiers from Europe in less than two years. For the first time in 70 years, there's not a single US tank on European soil that can be used in combat operations. General Patton must be rolling in his grave. The fact that the US military will soon have the smallest Navy since World War I, the smallest Army since before World War II, and the smallest Air Force ever. And this is at a time when Russian defense spending has increased 31% since 2008, but European defense spending has increased 15% during that same period. Then you have the unilateral self-disarmament of Europe which has meant that many of our European allies no longer have the capability to defend themselves. Only four out of 28 NATO members spend the required 2% of GDP on defense. And I'm very proud to say that Estonia is one of the four. And Estonia has made an effort to get their defense spending up to this level. To put this problem into perspective, New York City, not New York State, New York City spends more on policing than 13 NATO members each spend on their national defense. <laughs> then we have the Russian reset, which was the biggest failure uh, in terms of policy choices of them all. This administration has gained nothing from the Russian reset. 
on issues where Russia has agreed to cooperate, such as issues related to Afghanistan, they do so only because there is a Russian national interest at stake. And then consider the state of Russia. Nothing indicates that Russia is on the path to reform. Democratic freedoms are in retreat. Corruption is endemic. The future is bleak. The same failings that we saw in the Soviet Union a quarter of a century ago are starting to appear in Russia today. The Russian economy is growing, but it's heavily reliant on the export of hydrocarbons, of other raw materials, and of weapons. Russia's population is declining due to aging, rampant alcoholism, drug addiction, widespread disease, and low fertility rates. Expressions of ultranationalism in Russia are on the rise, which fortify Putin's government's quest for a new sphere of influence. The collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall caught many by surprise. Western leaders should not allow the resurgent Russia or the instability deriving from a degenerate Russia catch them by surprise too. So you take the administration's foreign policy assumptions that turned out to be false. Then you take the poor policy making that came from these false assumptions, and then you combine all of this with the current state of Russia, as I have just described, and you start to see how easily we find ourselves in the situation we face today. Russia's recent irredentist behavior in the Crimea has no place in the 21st century, and it has made many NATO partners with sizable Russian populations, especially in the Baltics, very nervous. And this is an issue that the US should address robustly if not for any other reason then we do have treaty obligations to the NATO members. The U.S. should be reassuring those NATO members in Central and Eastern Europe that their defense is guaranteed and that any spillover from any possible conflict will be contained. The increased contribution to the Baltic Air Policing mission by the United States Air Force is welcome, and the modest increase in troop numbers to what was already a very modest U.S. Air Detachment in Poland is also welcome the more can be done. For example, instead of sending more F-15s to the Baltic region, why not send F-22s? Ensure that whichever country takes over the Baltic air, air policing mission after the U.S. Um, in May keeps that current level of increased fighter jets. The U.S. should be pushing for that. The brigade combat team that's been earmarked, that's based in the United States, that's been earmarked for rotational duties to Europe should be sent to Europe. We hear so much about this brigade combat team. It was the justification the administration has given us for bringing home two brigade combat teams from Europe. Um, maybe we should put this force uh, rotational concept to the uh, test. In fact, the Heritage Foundation back in October published a detailed report that offers 22 concrete recommendations on what the U.S. can do to bolster security with the Baltic states because we forecast that something like this could very well happen in the region. And I recommend you go and uh, uh, search into Google and have a read of this uh, report. This is not as much about sending a signal to Russia as it is sending a signal to Eastern European NATO allies that the US remains committed. We should not hide these deployments under the cloak of training exercises, but we should explain them for what they really are to guarantee and to defend the territorial integrity of NATO countries near Russia. Perhaps even at this time we should susp suspend in part, if not in full, the NATO-Russia Founding Act of 1997, which places limitations on how NATO can behave in the um, NATO members in Eastern Europe. Now some will argue that all this stuff is provocative. This is not a provocation. This is a response. A provocation is annexing part of your neighbor. What I'm proposing for NATO is a responsible response, a defensive measure, not designed to liberate Crimea or provoke war with Russia, but designed to defend the alliance. It is time for Europe to get united on how to best deal with Russia as well. Right now, Europe needs a Margaret Thatcher, and they have a Kathy Ashton. Uh, we see the same old lowest common denominator uh, policy making in the European Union, where certain countries have special interests that they want to block uh, meaningful, meaningful sanctions for, um, or against Russia. And then we have NATO, whose point of view um, must be viewed as very inconsistent from Moscow. On one hand, the NATO Secretary General says that uh, this is the biggest crisis Europe's faced since the, 21st, uh, since the end of the Cold War. 
and that um, on the other hand, we still have France selling uh, amphibious assault ships to Russia. We still have Spain, which allows Russian Navy to use its territories in North Africa, and we still have um, Britain signing uh, military cooperation agreements with Russia. So, but that all being said, I really think that um, it's time that the West gets its, its act in order. And I'll conclude by saying that um, if I had to sum this up into a tweet, into 140 characters, it is that the uh, Russians are playing chess, the United States and the European Union are playing checkers. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. The upshot uh, of this panel is that we have the most serious crisis in Europe and possibly in the world since uh, the end of the Cold War. Uh, I do believe that the post-World War II order, not just post-Cold War order, but post-World War II order, in which concepts like territorial integrity and international guarantees were elevated uh, and uh, for better or for worse, international law and international organizations, as incomplete as they are, played a more prominent role, this whole world order may be in danger now. In danger because concepts like guarantees and sovereignty and territorial integrity are violated. There are a couple of aspects that we did not address for the lack of time. And these are internal Russian developments and the relations within the post-Soviet sphere. Internally, I do believe that this is a step from what was described in literature uh, as soft authoritarianism in which the institutions uh, still existed and political parties uh, still play acted elections um, I wouldn't go as far as calling it democracy, but there was a semblance of institutions to something completely different, to a nationalist hysteria, uh, to Russia behaving to a great degree in accordance with the ideas articulated and disseminated by one Alexander Dugin, the ideologue of new Russian imperialism, and what is most worrisome, that Alexander has his roots in the study of neo-Nazi ideologies and extreme, most extreme uh, new right and, and uh, fascist right-wing uh, ideologies of Europe. In terms of relations with the Russian so-called near abroad, the process that uh, we saw in its military phase in Georgia, but in its um, empire building state or sphere of influence state vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, countries like Kazakhstan and Belarus in the creation of the Eurasian Union with Armenia ascending to the customs union and with Kyrgyzstan possibly next in line. This will give a pause to the elites in these countries. The elites of these countries are now getting a very strong signal that if they don't do what Moscow tells them to do, they may be liberated or invaded. And these elites will be relegated to a secondary and tertiary roles as enforcers of the Kremlin's will in these territories, similar to or even less powerful than the Soviet republic elites in the Union Republics of the Soviet Union. So the questions I was asking 20 years ago in my dissertation in the book, Russian Imperialism, uh, are this. The question is this. Is Russia going to continue as a nation, nation state and a democracy? Or is it going to become an, an authoritarian imperialist state, an empire? And I think we are living through the days in which the answers to the questions are given in Crimea, in the Ukraine, and elsewhere. Thank you all very much. And now we'll go to the panel for Q&A. Oh, okay. Kurt, uh, Since sure. I'm going to have to leave, maybe I'd just like to jump in with one Please do. comment. 
Um, as you heard in my uh, remarks, I had somewhat of a pessimistic, if not tough, analysis of what's happening, and also uh, a call that we need to be serious about actions that we take, not just assuming that rhetoric will make a difference when Putin is willing to take actions. I want to make a, a, a point to, to qualify that. I don't think it's useful to beat our chest, to have a hysterical reaction, to, um, to, to take things that are just for display. I think it's very important to have a clear goals, define them clearly, and make sure our actions are commensurate with achieving those goals. So things such as you just said, Ariel, territorial integrity. Okay, well then, let's make sure that we actually protect territorial integrity, figure out what is required to do that, and target actions aimed at exactly that. Another thing I would say is that um, there are plenty of non-military actions, um, sanctions, financial sanctions, um, energy-related issues, travel bans, all that. And I don't think that we should assume that a military action is necessarily the only or the best way to achieve the specific goals that we set. It may be necessary, and I, I don't think we should shy away from talking about it. It's not as if that shouldn't be on the table. Keep it on the table. But let's think strategically about the clarity of our goals and the um, purpose of specific actions to achieve those goals. I think that's likely both to have the best outcome and also contribute to a stabilization at the end of a crisis that we're in now, uh, as opposed to uh, whipping up a crisis. Unfortunately, I don't think it's the European Union uh, to the extent that Estonia uh, can be a uh, representative of the European Union. And it's not the United States who is whipping up a crisis. Oh, I agree. To, to my, to my great, great distra distress. I was born in the Crimea. I was born in Yalta. I was there the last time in 2011. The majority of our population speaks Russian. A lot of younger kids speak Ukrainian also, like in the rest of Eastern Ukraine. They understand the language. Many of them speak it. I did not find any iota of evidence of discrimination against Ukrainians uh, in the Crimea uh, and being in touch uh, on uh, Facebook, on Skype with people in, in the Crimea that I know, they're horrified with this invasion. Uh, they did not, the Russian speakers, people who are ethnically Russian, they did not expect it and they think that things are going in a very wrong direction. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that and, and I was speaking not about whether Putin is the one whipping things up or not, it certainly is. Rather, the most effective way for us to manage it. Absolutely. All right. And thank you again if you need thank to you. dash I, out. Unfortunately, I don't. Yeah. Thank, thank, okay. thank you all. Okay. Thank you. One way through. Is, are there any other comments from the panel? Madam Ambassador, gentlemen, uh, the gentleman in the back, please introduce yourself and keep these questions or comments to about 30 seconds. Thank you, Ariel. Um, first, I'd like to say thanks to Stephen Blank and Luke Coffey for their presentations, although I think they pulled their punches a little bit. I have two <laughs> questions. First, to uh, the ambassador. Uh, Can you introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, sorry, John Kunstadter, Radzima Photo. Um, ambassador, in Finland, uh, there are graves of Estonians who fought uh, with Finland in the Winter War that say, for the free freedom of Finland and uh, for the honor of Estonia. And um, I, therefore, I, I was kind of surprised uh, to hear you say that Ukraine should have a place at the table in negotiations. Ukraine should be at the head of the table, and maybe the EU should have a place at the table. Why, why are we treating Ukraine as an object instead of a subject? Uh, and for Mr. Kisilov, I've followed you very closely on uh, Hromatska TV and uh, 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 um, Savik Schuster, and I've read a lot of things you said, but I don't understand what you're doing in Ukraine, what, uh, what your function is, and perhaps you could talk to us a bit about Ukrainians as people uh, and, uh, and maybe explain why you haven't learned Ukrainian. Thank you. Uh, well, let's let's uh, start, start with the ambassador. With yeah. ambassador. Thank you very much for your remark. I didn't mean if it, it, it sounded like that I want to see Ukrainians sitting not at the most important place at the table, that wasn't the idea. It's about Ukrainians. It has to be done by Ukrainians. Definitely, there is no question about that. It's Ukrainian thing, and they have to be at the table at the most 
prominent place. So if if anybody else understood it in another way, then I want to apologize. My message is that it's a Ukrainian thing, and they have to be, most important, discussing their future. Uh, I will start from the end. Actually, it was uh, a number of questions uh, about the Ukrainian language. Uh, I cannot speak Ukrainian. Uh, I understand when they speak Ukrainian to me, and, uh, well, for different reasons. Ukrainian uh, is a difficult language to learn uh, for a person whose native language is Russian. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to learn a language which is very close to your mother's tongue. Um, that's the explanation. But, uh, you know, when people are being invited to a, a talk show on, on a Ukrainian channels, they very often communicate in two different languages. You know, some speak Russian and some speak uh, Ukrainian. And uh, uh, if I may just... Um, Continuing the point that um, Ariel made uh, uh, several minutes ago, I, I can say something else. You know, in Kiev and even in Lvov, which is considered by many to be a stronghold of Ukrainian nationalism, uh, you can speak uh, Russian when you visit there, and uh, you will be having no problems with. Uh, not speaking Ukrainian. You know, there's no animosity there to Russian speakers. And I haven't heard uh, during those three months of Ukrainian revolution, I have never heard about a single case that a Russian was attacked, some, or a Russian-speaking man was somehow harassed or attacked either on the Maidan, which was taking place and still is continuing to take place in Kyiv or in the central square of uh, Lvov or any other uh, place. And as far as the second part of your question is concerned, well, I'm working in Ukraine uh, for almost six years. I live and work there. I was invited there to take part in a certain um, television project. Well, and I stayed. At the moment, I don't have a particular program that I present, but I hope that sometime in the future I will be back. That's my answer. Thank you very much. Let's uh, take maybe three more. Um, yeah, four more, three or four more uh, in a batch, and then we have to go. Um, okay. Now the old old ties that bound in the back. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Yaroslav Martinuk. I'm a retired sociologist, formerly with Intermedia. Um, and this a is friend a of mine from Paris days, huh, Slavko? Yes, yes, we go back a long ways, Ar. Um The debate in the, in the U.S. and somewhat in the European media has been modeled by uh, a number of paid and unpaid provocateurs, agents, and uh, Russia apologists. What would you say to people like Stephen Cohen or Posner or a number of other people? I, I think Yevgeny Kisilov is the best, uh, has the best expertise and knows these people uh, to answer this question. Yevgeny? Well, 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 with my, with all my due respect, uh, uh, Mr. Cohen, who wrote some very interesting books. That's that's not me. No, no, I'm speaking about <laughs> Stephen <laughs> Stephen Cohen. Right. Uh, I think Just making sure we. <laughs> no, no, no. We're speaking about the right Cohen. Uh, I'm speaking about St you, you mentioned Stephen yeah. Cohen, uh, who was kind of a big media star coming from the West in the years of uh, uh, Gorbachev and uh, Perestroika, uh, because he was one of the first um, Western scholars to speak and write about uh, the history of the Soviet Union uh, in the 30s, about Bukharin. He, he wrote, I think, a number of books on, uh, uh, um, devoted to the biography of uh, Nikolai Bukharin, um, one of the 
leading politicians of the Stalin's and Lenin and Stalin's time, who was considered a martyr um, uh, of Stalin's uh, purges. And uh, with all my due respect to what he's done uh, back in the 80s, I think today he is completely out of touch with a reality. And it's very difficult. Uh, well, it's very difficult basically to speak to a person uh, who lost touch with the reality. And, and I don't think that uh, there is any need to try to reconvince uh, an, a, a grown up and man who who believes in something without any rationale in it. Well, th this happens, you know, it's, 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 it's a matter of, it's not a matter of knowledge, it's a matter of faith, and faith uh, sometimes can be completely blind. Mm. And as far as Mr. Posner is concerned, well, look, mm, uh, he's a colleague of mine, and um, I have a rule. Um, I, don't, I don't criticize uh, or... Mm, uh, speak out publicly about the work and statements made by my uh, colleagues of television profession, probably with the exception of Dmitry Kiselev, my namesake. You know, uh, when they ask me about Dmitry Kiselev, who is the, now the biggest uh, and the loudest mouthpiece uh, of um, uh, Kremlin propaganda against Ukraine, well, uh, sometimes they ask, and are you not related to him? <laughs> I, I'm saying, uh, I'm always saying, uh, you know, I'm not even his namesake. <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw a number of hands, um, but we're really running out of time. So I'm going to make a decision to take three questions, one, two, three, together. The gentleman here, the lady behind, and the gentleman here. Yeah, my name uh, is Dr. Michael, sure. Michael Krauss. Uh, I head a consultancy called Secure Chain. Uh, I'm also a soldier, uh, two wars, four continents, five contingencies, and a historian. Uh, what would you, uh, as a panel, and by the way, this has been very illuminating, and thank you, what would you say uh, to our president today when he has a news conference with the Prime Minister of the Ukraine? on actions to take. I'm of the concept uh, that uh, Teddy Roosevelt was right. Speak softly and carry a big stick. Words without action, as the ambassador has reminded us, are meaningless. So during this largest crisis, I've heard uh, 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 words like scrap of paper, 1914, uh, the Zudaten and Austrian uh, seizure of minorities there uh, and the start of World War II. Those are the kind of situations we face today. So words without meanings, what would you, uh, perhaps Stephen, perhaps uh, uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, what would be your reaction and advice to our president today? Words plus actions. Okay, and uh, the lady here, please introduce yourself, yes. keep it short. Okay, I'm Diane Sayre. I recently was a, an independent candidate for governor of New Jersey. And <laughs> uh, actually, my question starts with that the, the entity, which I think all of you represent, the transatlantic system, is actually bankrupt. And what hasn't been taken up here is what's happened to the European Union, which is that in 14 nations, the death rate has exceeded the birth rate, you have over 60% youth unemployment in many countries, and in Greece and Spain, it is illegal to attack the EU publicly. You can be fined up to 30,000 euros and go to jail. Um, and what occurred in Ukraine in terms of violation of sovereignty is Victoria Nuland seems to have picked the whole government. Now, in 1971... Okay, what is a question, madam? Okay, my question is, yes. in 1971... Linda LaRouche defeated Abba Lerner oh, stop, in a stop, debate stop, 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 stop. by no, we're forcing not Linda Lerner LaRouche. to sorry, say sorry. that Time if, if Yalmar Schacht had no, been no. listened take... to, Hitler would not have been necessary. All right. So I want to know if we're okay. supporting we are not a Nazi reacting takeover to of Ukraine here. I'm sorry, guys. in order to impose bone-crushing okay. can austerity you, can you pass the mic? and the 50% cut mic, in pensions in Ukraine. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question here 
And then there was a question on this side. I'll discount this one. And, yeah. ContributorForbes.com. Uh, Crimea. Uh, isn't dislodging Russia from Crimea got to be at the front and center of any policy response? And without a specific strategy, however long term it may be to do that, why should Putin respect any national border? Well, the answer is nuclear weapons. Uh, last question over there, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joel Mandelman. I'm an attorney here in Washington. In light of everything that's been said, one, does the Ukraine have sufficient military power to defend itself if it were invaded? And two, short of military invention by NATO or the West, is anything really going, any other sanction really going to stop Putin from seizing half of the Ukraine or maybe eventually all maybe, of it? Yeah, maybe more than half. Um, okay, so real quick. From, I'll start with Luke and all the way work my way to the ambassador. Uh, actions, can we do anything about dislodging from Crimea? Um, Ukraine military power, actions by actions, that, that was the question about what should the president do. Uh, in 30 seconds or less. 30 seconds, okay. Well, uh, regarding the, um, the uh, summing up the situation in a tweet where I said, um, EU's play, EU and America are playing checkers, Russia is playing uh, um, chess. I would say that actually I'd revise it by saying that Russia is playing chess, the EU is playing checkers, and the U.S. is playing golf. And, <laughs> and if, you, if, you, if you want, in terms of advice to the president, I would say stop dithering on this issue because the longer you dither on it, the, the, vacation more, the stronger, is over. stronger uh, Russia looks and Russia gets on this. Yeah. So it's time for the president to say just something publicly about this That'd be a good starting point. On the, on the second point, <clears throat> the other question about, you know, what can we do to dislodge um, Russia from Crimea and then tying it in with your point about is the Ukrainian military up to something if they were invaded? Well, they were invaded. And I have to say, it strikes me as puzzling as a former soldier, as someone who's very patriotic, that I know everyone's trying to keep temperatures down, but I'm surprised. I'm actually impressed almost by the self-constraint by the Ukrainians. But before... Um, we can start even remotely talking about the West or NATO or anyone else intervening. Ukrainians are going to have to show us that they think Crimea is worth dying for first. So I think we're a long way off um, from any sort of Western intervention to, to dislodge Russia from Crimea. Well, uh, just uh, one comment. Wh whoever is playing chess in Czechos, Russia is carrying a baseball bat. <laughs> yeah. I happen to be one of those Mossbacks who believes that treaties should be observed. Pacta that, sum servanda, uh, that's Latin from 2,000 plus years ago. Well, I'm, I'm old enough to remember it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but uh, this is what I would recommend to the president. On the economic sphere, do what Eisenhower did in 56, bring down the ruble. I would pass legislation in the Senate and House putting sanctions on R Russian banking and business, the same that we have on Iran and bring the Europeans into it, and it's going to take some effort, but I would do it even before they did, because it's, it, will, it might hurt us, but it'll hurt them a lot more, and it'll hurt European banks because of what we've seen happening with Iran, where it has that uh, effect. Third, institute the WTO proceedings against Russia for violating Armenia, Ukraine, and so on. Fourth, no G8. Fifth, I would scrap the defense budget Secretary Hagel sent last week and put in a new one. I'm going to be giving details of this in a paper in April. But the things Luke talked about are some of the examples. I would also put a permanent fleet into the Black Sea, for NATO Black sea, sea, Fleet, not, not American, a NATO uh, command into the Black Sea with appropriate air cover and so on. Uh, I would have sent NATO liaison officers at, at Ukraine's request to the uh, bases and institutions in Crimea and def defy the Russians to, to prevent them from coming in or, or attack them, because then that would mean an attack on NATO. Fourth, I would put missile defenses in Poland and the Baltic states, because now the Russians have shown they are a threat, so we don't have to pretend it's only Iran. And fifth, if, the, if Moscow tears up an arms control treaty, I'd say, be my guest. We're prepared mm -hmm. to spend you into the ground. That's a few things. Thank you. Okay, please, well, short. Uh, I will not. Uh, repeat all the points uh, made just before. 
I completely agree with it. I, I will probably add to it a uh, thing that can be argued and unpopular. Uh, the West, the United States, Europe, uh, through existing channels, should uh, initiate um, um, that the process of um, not letting Russia stage the football cup in 19... 2018. That will be a very effective uh, thing against because because after the Olympics, football World Cup in uh, 2018 is another big price uh, that that's Putin all, all, all already caressing in his hands. Mm. Uh, take it away from him. The the football cup may take place in another country. You know, remember, in, in you Ukraine, remember in Ukraine. Former, <laughs> well, remember former Yugoslavia was uh, expelled from uh, football competitions uh, because uh, because of the war. And as far as Mr. Obama is concerned, I think that my recommendation to American president, if I may, would be not to threat Russia uh, with uh, sanctions, to announce that the sanctions has already taken place. Do not forget, uh, Mr. President, that uh, U.S. reputation as a leader of the free world is at stake. Don't forget that. It's about basic values of Western civilization. It's not about you know, tactical maneuvers on the international scheme. Well, as much as uh, I would add a couple of things, as much, much as Europe is absolutely crucial, it's happening in Europe, we have other allies around the world and we need to coordinate a global strategy, not a continental strategy. That's number one. Number two, um, I think we need some new brains for the kind of engagement we're looking down the pike. This is not reset. This is not post-Cold War, War bliss. We ate the peace dividend. It's over wake up and smell the vodka. Now, uh, we abandoned and neglected our public diplomacy. When Slavko and I worked for international broadcasting, the international broadcasting budget, uh, at least in, the, in that part of the world, Slavko was what, 10 times higher maybe? In, in real dollars? It was probably 10 times higher. We did audience research, we, we understood the audiences, and of course it was with the technology of the day, shortwave broadcasting primarily. Forget about it, it's all online, it's all multimedia. We don't do it. What we do do, we host Russia today in Washington with a bureau of 100 people here. Doing what exactly? Not counting Russia today in New York and other places. This is the equivalent of publishing Volkischer Beobachter in English in 1939 in New York. Give me a break. We need to rethink public diplomacy. It's a powerful tool. I'll shut myself up here and go to the summary by the ambassador and when, then we quit. Madam Ambassador. Thank you. First of all, about sanctions, I do believe that the sanctions will work because <clears throat> Europe is Russia's largest trading partner. And uh, since the beginning of the 90s, Russia has gained from very good trade relations with Europe. So I do think that they will have a real impact. At the same time, of course, as I said, Europe should take into account that there most probably will be countermeasures, which means that we have to be prepared for that. If we need any financial implications, analysis, or whatever, we have to do that. We have to be prepared for that. And if for uh, more than 20 years we were tying ourselves towards Russian energy markets, then it's the time to stop another process, detying us. What's the right? Retying, detying D us. Disengagement. But it, I'm, I'm telling you as, as an energy expert, it takes five years to do it takes, that. It takes. But uh, we have to do that. We have to start doing that. And LNG gives great opportunities for that. Uh, uh, advice to President Obama. As an Estonian ambassador, <laughs> I have my personal opinion, but I'm not going to advise US president. <laughs> but I'd, I'd like to compliment. As a private citizen. 
but I'd like to compliment U.S. administration. What the outreach to the allies, partners in Europe, and much more wider is great. The number of phone calls President Obama and Vice President are doing with European partners, NATO partners, absolutely admirable. So I, I have to say that outreach has been absolutely great. And we have to be united here, Europe, US, and I agree very much with what has been said that, uh, that deeds have to follow words, but don't underestimate words. Sometimes words can also do great things. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for watching online. This will be available in the events archive, at probably as of tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, and thank you again for coming uh, to one of our events. Thank you very much. <laughs>